And a pleasure to be here. It's nice to see uh, so many distinguished and also so many familiar faces and some that are both. Um, the Simons collaboration on the Origins of Life is just a great opportunity for us in the field. Uh, and and as, as you will see over this lecture series, it's a highly interdisciplinary field to come together and, and share different types of expertise and knowledge. Too much? Overmodulated? Is that better? Yeah, okay, good. All right, good. Um, so I thought I would do something a bit different today than the usual scientific talk that I would give, recognizing uh, some of the, the, the deep heritage of the Simons Foundation in supporting work in the applied mathematical sciences as well as pure mathematical sciences, and try to make a connection between uh, the work of John von Neumann, uh, one of the greatest applied mathematicians of all time, uh, and what we think about with regard to the ordens of life and, and Darwinian evolution. So I'm, I'm sure almost everyone in this audience is familiar with John von Neumann, Hungarian-born American uh, mathematician, spent most of his career at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Uh, tremendous contributions in, in basic and applied mathematical sciences in game theory and economic theory. Uh, what I want to talk about today, though, particularly relates to his work on what became essentially the modern computer. When we think about digital computers, uh, they can trace their ancestry to several pioneers, uh, certainly Alan Turing, but specifically for the architecture that one thinks of as at the heart of computers, the so-called von Neumann architecture. Now, we, we take it for granted that this is how computers work, and I suppose it didn't have to be this way, but this is what stuck as the, the formulation for what makes a general purpose digital computer uh, is you know, there's ways to bring information into the device, uh, you know, all different types of input uh, channels. There's ways to take information out of the device. But within the, the guts of the machine, the central processing unit, uh, are uh, 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 calculations that control the input and output uh, that actually perform the arithmetic operations, do the, the logical operations on the data. And then part of the, a, a key aspect of the von Neumann architecture, a memory, a place that information can be put in on hold and a common memory in the way von Neumann thought of it uh, for uh, storing uh, data as well as processing data. So that's, that's the von Neumann architecture. And as I said, we've, all of our computers have descended from this. Uh, if you're a biologist, you might point to LUCA, the last universal common ancestor of all computers, which is ENIAC. This was the first general purpose programmable digital computer. Uh, this was a project uh, at, during World War II, sponsored by the Army, uh, carried out at the University of Pennsylvania that was classified work and had to do with developing an, an instrument, a computational instrument, that could help calculate artillery trajectories. So that was why the Army threw the money at ENIAC. But as I say, that is the last common ancestor of all uh, computers that follow the von Neumann architecture. Von Neumann uh, wasn't directly involved in ENIAC. He did work on uh, a descendant computer called Maniac. Uh, Maniac, uh, unlike ENIAC, uh, to program Maniac, one could uh, play off of information on a tape. In ENIAC, one had to unplug and replug in various jumper cables uh, to, to set the program into the computer. Uh, and then Maniac had all kinds of applications in both uh, military sciences, in particular uh, high energy uh, implosions uh, related to the nuclear weapons program, but also practical applications. Uh, well, I guess in some ways it's practical when it's military, but uh, applications in civilian world having to do with things like earliest predictions of weather and, and other complex phenomena. Von Neumann was always interested in achieving the greatest possible generality for these computational devices. So digital, programmable, essentially an infinite kind of memory. He wanted the devices to be computationally complete so that essentially any logical computational operation could be carried out within the computer. And he wanted more than that. He wanted the computer to have the capacity, at least logical capacity, to be construction universal, to have the ability to describe the construction of any realizable physical object. And if it could describe the construction of any realizable physical object, what would be the most interesting thing for such a computer to construct? Another computer. And so toward the end of his life, von Neumann turned his attention to designing universal computational devices that were also construction universal, including the ability to construct more of themselves, a so-called self-reproducing computer. And he thought about, but never implemented, the idea of even going beyond that to an evolving computer, a computer that not only produced progeny computers, but those progeny computers would continue to evolve to become more and more uh, fit for whatever task the programmer set them towards. That's pretty forward thinking for the 1950s. Uh, von Neumann 
uh, sadly uh, died before he could publish his work on self-reproducing computers or self-reproducing automata, automata being a formal way of describing a computational device. Uh, it was some years after his, uh, his death that Arthur Burks published the manuscript that uh, von Neumann had written uh, about describing a self-reproducing computer, a self-reproducing automata. And this self-reproducing -re automata was based on uh, what's called a finite state machine. This is a, another way of describing a computational device that inhabits, notionally, this is a logical description of such a device, a, a checkerboard, a two-dimensional grid. So this is called a cellular automata. And just think of a giant checkerboard with lots of little spaces on the grid. And each of the cells in this cellular automata can have a state. And that state can change influenced by the state of the neighboring cells. It turns out such a device is computationally universal and construction universal. And von Neumann showed how it could actually replicate itself. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but he does go through it in detail in this, in this manuscript. This is the von Neumann self-reproducing automata. I'm not showing every one of the cells. There's thousands of them. I'm not showing the states that each of those cells can exist in, but each of those cells can exist in any one of 29 different specified states. But this is the, the specification for such a device. Now, I know we have a lot of biologists in the room, so I'm going to continue to translate computer speak into biology speak. OK, so now let's describe just generically what this device does. There is a memory, and it is a tape and it stores information in the state of the cells that are in the tape. And that tape is read by a read head. We would now call that RNA polymerase in the biological world, reading the tape of DNA. And then takes the information from that read, feeds it through the tape control units, processes it, sends instructions to a construction arm that goes out and builds things. Now remember, building here is the arm moving into empty space on the grid and laying down new states until eventually the construction arm has built the entire device at a neighboring position on the grid. Okay, but there's more to it than that. There's the information part. So the tape then has to be copied. Whatever information on the tape has to be read, sent through the device, and then written to make a daughter tape, a progeny tape, at the adjacent position on the grid, right? And then a button is pressed, effectively, a signal is sent, to start the progeny machine doing the same thing, and so on and so on and so on. Now, in the nth detail, he worked this out. And just like biology, it turns out most of the details have to do with signal transduction. It's all about the timing circuits and all these different little pulsars that can send out different little signals that help time all of all the coordinated behaviors. But the bottom line is he gave a complete description of a, of a logical device that could make more of the logical device. Mm -hmm and is computation universal because the tape can, can, can describe any logical operation and the daughter machine can do the same. Okay, so what I wanna talk about today though uh, are finite state automata and moving them from not just replication but towards evolution. So here's a, just a simplification of a finite state automata. Just think of this as another way to describe a computer. It can exist in any one of a number of different states for simplicity four states. In von Neumann's case, 29 states for each of those cells that collectively made up the device. But think of a multi-state entity, computational device, and it receives input from, from the environment. And that input can be, say, binary input, ones and zeros. And depending on what state the device is in and what input it receives, it'll move to a different state. All right, so that's just a way to describe what goes on inside the guts of a computer. So if in state one, the input is a zero or a one, the device might transition to state two or to state three, and so on. One could describe a state transition diagram for this four-state finite state automata. So any possible binary input from any starting state would then take it to the next state. So here's how such a device computes. Let's say it starts in state one and receives a particular input and then transitions to the next state. So suppose it receives an input of zero, well then it will move to state two. And then it receives an input of one back to state one, and so on. And so in this way, an input string being fed into this computational device drives the device through finite state transitions as it moves from state to state. Furthermore, with each state transition, one can associate an output. Let's make it binary to be simple. So that now when an input string comes in and the device goes through its, its computation, it's churning from state to state based on that input, it then generates an output string. All right, so that's a computer. It's just a different way of describing a computer. Finite state automata are also computational and potentially construction universal. 
But now to, be, to move it more towards molecules and biology, I'd like to talk about automata genetics, all right? Because that's phenotype, as the biologists would say. This is the behavior of a entity, a computational entity in this case, that in its environment receives input, undergoes state changes, and produces output. And in this case, we know everything about the phenotype of this device. Here it is, completely enumerated for us. So given any particular starting state and an input of 0 or 1, one knows what the next state will be and what the output will be. And so from any string of input, one can know what the phenotype will be as the, as the device goes through its state changes and produces a string of output. Now where is the genotype in this machina? Okay, it is actually built into this description of phenotype. If we just take the information that is in this, this state transition and output transition table and represent it as a string, that's the genotype of this device. So in a purely informational sense, just like the information that's on the tape in the, in the replicating von Neumann machine, these are just, this is just raw information. But through this genetic code, that raw information can be translated into all possible phenotypes given, given environment. All right, so what I'm describing here is a, is a device, but I'm, as, as I think you know from the language I'm trying to use, I'm also describing a biological entity that receives input from its environment, goes through state changes, and can produce output. But of course, biological entities don't just compute based on what's in their environment. They replicate and they evolve. So we need to talk about automata evolution. What if we have an entire population of genotypes? Many of these little strings of information that are in our soup, our soup in this case being a, a simulation inside a computer, but we're going to get to molecules where the soup is liquid and the bits of information are molecular entities in that liquid. So what if we have a population of genotypes, each of which describes a different phenotype based on the translation type table that, that I showed you? What if we then establish a fitness function for that population? And now the fitness is based not on the genotype, but on the function that the genotype encodes. And one could have a variety of fitness functions, but how about this one? The ability of the output of the device to predict the next input. Okay, and I'm not suggesting that this device has consciousness, that it is somehow you know, thinking about what the next output can be. It means that the device can be in synchrony in some sense with any regularity that exists in its environment received as input and then, in that sense, predicting what the next, in, the next output would be. One could do it either way, but in, in the example I'm going to show you perfectly, rather than probabilistically. Okay, so now we have a fitness function, and then, of course, one needs to link fitness to replication. So how about the higher the fitness, the faster it replicates. What does replication mean? It means duplicate the string. Only don't duplicate the string perfectly. Allow for the possibility of random mutations, bit flips, or state number changes. And that would create a daughter string that would resemble but not be identical to its parent. And now we need a selection constraint so that these strings, which encode devices, which are uh, trying to predict the next input uh, to achieve replication, fight amongst themselves. And so one constraint would be to say, and the total size of the population shall be constant. OK? So this is real stuff. I'm taking you back in time now to 1982. Uh, that was the year that Renaissance Technologies was founded. Uh, while you were doing that, I was a graduate student working on the mighty Chromemco System 3, the most powerful desktop computer of its time, uh, with, a, with the wonderful Z80 processor and a whopping 64K of RAM. That held the system, that held the executables, that had all the memory for, for doing what I just talked about. You know, this thing really had floppy drives. I mean, the, the disks were floppy, you know, eight-inch disks. But it was a powerful machine because it could pull four megahertz. Of course, to do that, you had to pull out the motherboard and hit the, the little dip switch here. And then it would be all wonky, so you'd have to go back to two megahertz. But, but anyway, I had my hands on one of these back in the early 80s and did automata evolution. So it, permit me this indulgence, uh, this, this uh, trip back in time for myself. I promise, as Jack said, I will take you up to date and by the end of the talk, I will describe some unpublished work of just the last few months. But we're 30 years ago now, and we're going to do just what I showed you, evolve some automata in the computer. Now, with only 64K of memory, there's only so much we can do. So our population size is between 100 and 1,000. 100 in this case. The number of states per entity in the population is between 4 and 10. 
And now we need some challenge for, for that population of finite state automata. Initially just randomly chosen, it's just random strings, 100 of them. We ask them to predict what the next input would be based on their current output. Every time the prediction is correct, they get a brownie point. After 50 brownie points, they get to reproduce. The, the string is copied, subject to mutational error to produce a progeny string. And if they're doing no better than random chance, after 100 cycles, they're deleted. OK, so that's the game. And let's start it out with perfect replication fidelity. Every copying is going to faithfully reproduce the, the parental string to a progeny string. And here's the environment. It's a simple environment. It's the repeating sequence 101, 101, 101, 101. All right, so any replicating automata that can sync to that wins. Anyone that doesn't loses. OK, so here we go. This is just time and computer cycle time. Uh, rounds through the prediction uh, for the 100 individuals in the population. And you can see that after a certain amount of time, everybody's getting it right. Of course, there's not so many variants left in the population because only two of the 100 starting individuals in the population are synced to 101. So they're what's left in the population, although it's doing an excellent job. OK? Now, what if we make the selection constraint more stringent? Now, after 10 predictions, you get to replicate. And after 20 time cycles, you're out. Same thing. OK, but, but this isn't evolution yet. This is just strings replicating and the strings that can predict the next input winning and those that can't being removed from the population. In evolution, the environment can change. What used to be 101, 101 can become 1001. And now none of the molecules in the population are good at that. They're basically doing about 60 some odd percent here in, in prediction value. And that's what happens when the environment changes. But notice that the copying here is perfect fidelity. Every copy is the same as the winning parent. So if the environment changes, and you can think about this certainly in terms of biology as well, if the environment changes and there was no possibility of mutation to our progeny, we will become extinct as a species. Uh, but what if there is the possibility of mutation? What if one time out of 100 or five times out of 100 of each of the elements in the string, the genetic string, there's a random mutation? Well, then one has to live with a cloud of mutants that diminish the overall fitness of the population. With 1% error rate, the population isn't quite as fit because there's those pesky mutants always being produced. And with 5% error rate, it's even worse. But when the environment changes, the population has the ability to respond. And that's what evolution is. OK, so that's what I want to talk about is evolution, Darwinian evolution. Whether it's molecules or computational devices or our entire biosphere, the principles of Darwinian evolution are just what I showed you in a computational sense. They can be applied in these, all these other settings, but there's nothing magical or mystical about Darwinian evolution. It is a computational process. It's a process of amplifying information, genetic strings, that are fit become amplified to produce a larger number of progeny strings. For evolution to occur, amplification has to be imperfect. Occasional mutation introduces variation in the population. And that variation gives rise to more or less fit individuals. But those that are more fit, not as strings, but as the corresponding phenotype of that string, those individuals that are more fit, they're the survivors that give rise to the progeny of the next generation. So that's, again, the Darwinian recipe, but, but spoken more generally. OK, now let's turn to molecules. And as, fun, as much fun as it is playing in the computer, uh, others have been playing with molecules long before, even though it's been a long time, I know, Jack, since I started working in this area. Even before then, other people were working on the idea of test tube evolution. The first test tube evolution experiment with molecules, oh, sorry. Uh, this is just to say that, uh, of course, this can apply to organisms as well. And if one thinks about selecting for traits, if, if fluffy is what you want, you might get something like this. If skewt, I mean skewt, not cute. If skewt is what you want, you would get something like a Cornish Rex, right? So if one now takes hold of the process of evolution and controls the selection constraints, one can drive the population toward particular phenotypes. So that, that too is Darwinian evolution, but this is not natural evolution. Pretty unnatural, actually, but it's, uh, these are real organisms, but they're, they're unnaturally evolved by uh, perverse breeders of, of this uh, particular species. OK, let's get back to molecules and away from cats. I'm much, much better with molecules than cats. Uh, so the first test tube evolution experiment with molecules 
was carried out by Saul Spiegelman and his colleagues, then at the University of Illinois, later at Columbia University here. Uh, Spiegelman studied an RNA molecule, so now we're going to be talking about RNA pretty much for the rest of the talk, an RNA molecule that could be evolved in the test tube apart from any cells. All right, so this is not a computer simulation. Now this is, this is molecules, uh, but no cells. This is an extracellular Darwinian evolution experiment with a nucleic acid molecule, RNA, ribonucleic acid is the molecule he used. He unfortunately uses the phrase self-duplicating, and as you'll see, that's, that's incorrect. That's, the referee should have picked up on that. The nucleic acid molecule is not self-duplicating. A process is duplicating the nucleic acid molecules, just like I ran a subroutine to duplicate those genetic strings when I was evolving automata. But here's what's going on in Spiegelman's test tubes. Uh, the particular molecule in play is a genome RNA molecule from a, from a virus, a bacteriophage called Q-beta. Q-beta bacteriophage infects E. coli in the wild, but if you just take the, the genetic material out of Q-beta and put it in a test tube and provide the machinery that replicates Q-beta, so that's why I say it's not self-duplicating, the RNA doesn't duplicate itself, this replicates protein that comes from biology, that comes from Q-beta, replicates Q-beta RNA in the test tube, builds new copies of Q-beta RNA out of the building blocks of RNA, what are called the NTPs, the four different building blocks of RNA. And some number of input copies of RNA become copied to produce some larger number of progeny copies of RNA in that test tube, using up the building blocks uh, thanks to the efforts of Q-beta replicase. And then what happens if after, say, 20 minutes, uh, the experimenters withdraw 20 microliters of this 250 microliter volume and put them in a new test tube. All right now, I want you to put yourself in the mind of you are an RNA molecule, you've landed in this happy test tube, this big thing called Q beta replicase comes and grabs you and produces progeny that, that are, are near perfect but occasionally mutant copies of yourself. And then the experimenter comes along after 20 minutes and withdraws 20 microliters. If any of your descendants are to survive that event, then you need to produce more descendants than the dilution factor that, that took place at that time point, especially if that process continues in what's called serial dilution, and this is what they did. Every 20 minutes, 20 of the 250 microliters are transferred to a fresh test tube. The only RNA that goes in the first test tube is the input. The only RNA that goes in the subsequent test tubes are whatever happened to reside at the end of the time period in the previous test tube. And so if a molecule doesn't produce 12.5 copies on average in 20 minutes, its numbers will diminish over time and it will be diluted out of, out of existence. But if its numbers, if it produces more than 12.5 copies in 20 minutes, its numbers increase over time. But of course, all the molecules can be doing that. And it really becomes a battle, a, a molecule to molecule battle. Whatever molecules most efficiently attract the replicase that utilizes the, the building blocks to produce progeny molecules outcompetes its fellow molecules in the test tube. And here's the actual data from their paper back in, in 1967. This is the accumulation of RNA over 74 successive transfers. And it starts out plodding along. And then something really cool happens after the eighth transfer. It picks up the pace. Now, what was that all about? Well, what that was about was mutants arose because of errors in copying the RNA molecules that were more fit than their parents. And replication of those mutants was faster than replication of the parents. And those mutant progeny began to take over the population. So much so that at this point, they said they decreased the time to 15 minutes, and then 10 minutes, and then 7 minutes, and then 5 minutes. And what came out in the end was essentially a streamlined version of what went in at the beginning, a version, a minimized version of the genome that was only 17% of the size of the original genome, but was replicated 15 times faster. All the things that were necessary for infecting E. coli were irrelevant in these little test tubes. Just attract the, the replicase, get yourself replicated, and you win. And that means being small, lean, and mean, but also attracting the, the Q beta replicase to get yourself replicated. Okay, so that's the first test tube evolution experiment. And as I say, that was done by Saul Spiegelman back in the late 60s, in 1967, that paper was published. Spiegelman received the Lasker Award for his work on extracellular replication of RNA viruses, including the work I just talked about. Spiegelman, I think, would have loved to replicate all kinds of things and evolve all kinds of different RNAs, but in those days, uh, there just weren't the tools to replicate any RNA you want. Q-beta replicates, replicates Q-beta RNA because that's a fit thing for Q-beta to do, is to replicate its own genome. 
It wasn't until some time later that this guy came along, Kerry Mullis, and invented something called the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which then made it possible to replicate essentially any sequence. That too was 1982, so while I was still playing on Micromemco and, and Jim was starting some big things, Kerry Mullis uh, in between uh, different, uh, well, I won't talk about his drug abuse at the time, but anyway, he invented something called the PCR, and it then became possible to essentially replicate any RNA sequence. PCR is a technique for replicating DNA, but if one starts with RNA, you can convert that RNA to a complementary DNA, to double-stranded DNA, run the PCR to produce many copies of that, of that uh, sequence, and then turn that back to RNA. So with, with the PCR, now technology exists to copy any RNA sequence, not just Q-beta RNA. And one can introduce mutations during the process of replication. One can impose a selection constraint on the RNA molecules so that they must have some function in order to be amplified subject to mutation. And the game of evolution of RNA is on. All right, so, wow, if we can evolve any RNA, what should we evolve? What would von Neumann say we should evolve? We should evolve an RNA that makes more of the RNA that we're evolving, right? An, an RNA self-duplicating RNA machine. In fact, preferably one that can undergo Darwinian evolution. Francis Crick said this very explicitly in 1968, speaking about the origins of life on Earth and pointing to what he considered to be the first enzyme of biology, an RNA molecule whose function is to act as a replicase for RNA, including copies of itself. Then you'd have a self-duplicating, self-evolving RNA molecule and life Darwinian evolution at the molecular level would be on. Richard Dawkins put it this way in, in The Selfish Gene. We will call it the replicator. It has the extraordinary property of being able to create copies of itself. You know, I don't know why he capitalizes replicator, because he doesn't capitalize God, you know, but, and, <laughs> and I don't know, why does he say create? Why doesn't he just say synthesize? Is he trying to make a point here? You know, anyway. So we want one of these, okay? Not, not because of some atheistic agenda, but because we want to make life. So we're interested in RNA catalyzed RNA replication. And what does that mean? It means there are parental strings. Okay, these are not strings of describing finite state automata. These are actual molecules of RNA that have a particular sequence of letters in them. And those strings give rise to a larger number of progeny strings, give or take the occasional random mutation. And those progeny strings, think of them as genotypes, but those genotypes also encode a functional entity, right? A, a, fin a molecular finite state automata that can exist in a number of different states that can receive input, undergo state transitions, and produce output. I'm talking about molecules now, not computers. And of course, the most interesting of the, such output would be the ability to bring about the copying of the strings. So that's what we're after, is one of those. OK, now I'm going to spend the rest of the talk give, telling you three case studies in trying to do just this. And they all involve the same approach, but have taken different directions. What we want is to discover through test tube evolution an RNA molecule that, you know, it doesn't have to be fuzzy, it doesn't have to be skewed, it just has to do this. It has to take a parental string of RNA and join together pieces to produce a progeny string of RNA. In chemical terms, a template of RNA will bind building blocks, complementary building blocks of RNA, and promote chemistry to join those two pieces or more pieces together. That's what we want. Now, how do we get that? Well, we could make a whole bunch of random strings and hope some of them can do that reaction. And if any of them do, then those are the winners and they'll be reproduced subject to mutational error and we'll breed them just like you're breeding cats, only we're going to breed molecules. And that's what we've done. So random sequences of RNA are inserted into this template molecule. The template is joined to one of the two substrates. Handles are placed at both ends. These become handles actually for PCR amplification, the, the mollus technique that we're going to use to amplify any successful molecules. But what the molecules need to do in order to survive is bring about that reaction. Join those two pieces together, unifying all this into one completed molecule and only replicate such completed molecules. Now the first person to actually implement this approach for developing an RNA joining RNA enzyme is sitting right there, Jack Shostak. He and his former uh, graduate student, Dave Bartell, in 1993, wow, that was a long time ago, Jack. <laughs> You've been in this game a long time. Uh, developed out of random sequence this particular informational functional entity that brings about that joining reaction with a very nice uh, uh, kinetic parameters uh, and has a little mini template built into it that, that helps promote that reaction. So this is an RNA enzyme 
built out of random sequence through a process of test tube Darwinian evolution using the technique I just outlined on the previous slide. And here it is. It's, you know, it's a finite state automata molecular style that folds into a shape that has the function of joining together two pieces of RNA held together on a template. And why is that the reaction that's so key here if we're, if we're marching to uh, the, the request of, of Francis Crick and, and, and uh, Richard Dawkins? Because the chemistry of joining pieces together is the, is the chemistry of copying information. If you can do it once, you can do it more than once. And not just make a joining reaction, but copy an entire string of information. Right? So this is just like von Neumann's uh, self-replicating finite state automata, now copying the tape from the former position to the new position on the grid. All right? Letter by letter, copying the tape. And so that's the goal, is to take the joining reaction, not just from a single joining reaction, but to what is called polymerization, multiple successive joining reactions. And well, here's how it's been going. It's been quite a story over the last couple decades. These are the key figures of merit. How big is the enzyme that does the job in nucleotides? And how many letters can it string together in nucleotides? And this is how it's been going since the early 90s with a variety of authors. Originally, Dave Bartel, as I say, Jack's former uh, grad student, uh, now at the Whitehead Institute. Um, Peter Unrau, Dave's former postdoc. Uh, Phil Holliger and his colleagues at the MRC in Cambridge have marched this along to the point that last year, a kind of threshold has been crossed. The enzyme now contains about 200 nucleotides and, in best case, can string together about 200 nucleotides. Well, that's pretty good. Are we in business? Does that mean the enzyme can, is the replicator, can start producing more of itself and evolve in a self-sustained manner? No, not yet. All right, so here's where this, this case study stands right now. It can do this, but only for the very best sequence. More typically, it's, it can add about 10. You know, nothing like 200. But for the best possible sequence, it can do that. Uh, the enzyme actually is tethered to the template, holding on through Watson-Crick pairing. The enzyme is very good at adding Gs, not so good at adding Cs, and that's bad because if the template contains a lot of Gs, then the complement contains a lot of Cs, and it's hard to copy a sequence back and forth, and the yield is pretty crummy. I mean, it's great work, and it's been a lot of effort, and it's been a fair amount of time, uh, but it's not there yet. Okay, second case study. Let's try again. Same game. Out of random sequence space is going to come a motif, an RNA enzyme that can bring about this joining reaction. This is work we did uh, more than 10 years ago now. Out comes another one of these things. This is another one of these RNA joining enzymes. Uh, this one's smaller, only 62 nucleotides. It's a little slower. But why I'm telling you about this one is it has very simple architecture. This is all it's about. There has to be this sort of catalytic center that brings about the joining reaction. And the rest is along for the ride, just sort of Stems of RNA, stem of RNA, stem of RNA, and then the magic sequence discovered by test tube evolution. So if it's that generic, if this thing, this enzyme E, can join together essentially any A piece that it binds on a template and any B piece that it binds on a template with this little head group on it, then what if the A and the B piece, when joined together, make another E? So here's an enzyme. And here's an A piece and a B piece. Here's the joining spot. But notice if A and B become joined, they make another E. So E catalyzes the joining of A and B to make another E. That's a kind of replication. Now, it's only one joining event to achieve that replication, but it's a kind of replication. And actually, the way we like to do this is we have two enzymes, E and E prime. E grabs two pieces, joins them together to make E prime. E prime grabs two pieces, joins them together to make E. So here's how replication is going to work. We have E. It binds the pieces A prime and B prime to make a complex. Meanwhile, E prime grabs two pieces, binds them together to make the other complex. Either one of these complexes is then a catalytic uh, complex that can produce the other enzyme. So now we have E and E prime. They come apart, and the process continues. All right, so that's how to do what we call cross-replication uh, with this evolved little RNA enzyme. And it works. This thing goes critical. It goes exponential. So at a constant temperature, starting with a small amount of E and E prime, the duplications just keep on running. Again, it's like the von Neumann automata reaching into another space on the grid, only this is all happening in solution at a constant temperature. The parents produce progeny. The progeny produce more progeny. In about five hours, a hundredfold 
amplification of what was there at the beginning. It would keep going exponential, except it eventually runs out of building blocks and begins to level off. So we need to do a Spiegelman. We need to do a serial transfer and keep refreshing the supply of building blocks. So now after every few hours, we're going to do a 25 to 1 dilution. Each next test tube has a fresh supply of building blocks. But unlike in Spiegelman's case, there's no Q beta replicates. There's no duplicator out there. It's just the RNA enzymes self-duplicating by constructing each other out of the building blocks. And this will just go. Growth and dilution, growth and dilution. And it'll just keep doing that until, until we get tired or bored. Million, a billion-fold, roughly, amplification in about 30 hours in this case. OK, but that is kind of boring. I mean, not the first time we did it, but, but it is kind of boring because this is not evolution. This is just replication. What we need are selection constraints, competition, mutation, Darwinian evolution. What we need is a basis for evolution, which means we need genetics. And in this system, there is such genetics because, as I said, there's a kind of generic region in these molecules that can be any paired sequence. We can think of those as two little genes in this molecule. And those genes encode, through physical association, traits, functional traits. And one can have many different variants, many different sequences in the gene and corresponding uh, structure and function in the traits. And mutation can arise by shuffling the two different genes. It's a kind of, well, it's very much a toy genetics, but it's, but it's real. It's real molecules. It's not a simulation. And so what if we make a variety of different sequences and corresponding traits for each of the two halves, giving a potential search space of 65,000? I mean, it's better than what I could do on my Chromemco. You know, but you know, molecules are, well, they're not as cheap as electrons, but, uh, but they're certainly cheaper than, than RAM. Um, Let's let this population evolve. OK, so here we go. This is one of these kind of what we call zigzag plots of growth and dilution. But now, an entire population of different sequences competing for the entire set of building blocks that support those sequences and their recombinant variants. Off it goes. At this point, we remove the building blocks that weren't productively contributing to uh, growing enzyme molecules and continued out for more time and so on. So I don't know, are you dying to know the answer? And the winner is? Well, there's lots of winners, because it's not one thing that wins. Uh, and there's new variants being spun out, thanks to recombination. Um, well, it's not much to look at, but this is the winner. Yes, it's the A245B59 thing replicating with the A64 prime B213 prime thing. That's the most common sequence in the population for reasons I won't go into, but having to do with the structure within its catalytic center and the behavior of its pairing regions. But it's not alone. There's some sort of subdominant uh, individuals coming along with it using the same B pieces, or B prime pieces, but different A prime pieces. OK, so that's, that's genetics. That's, that's in a test tube, self-sustained replication and evolution. Now, you could say, is this biological? And I would say, no, this is chemical, because this was built not out of anything from biology. There's no Q beta replicase. There's no proteins or any macromolecules from biology. It was all built in the test tube. If you look at certain creationist blogs, you will see them point to the intelligence of my students and postdocs as being critical here. And I take that as a compliment. Okay, But the fact is, there's nothing here that came from biology. This all came from work in the laboratory. And, and to really drive home that point, let me, let me uh, note, and as I think most people know, nucleic acid molecules have a handedness to them. The sugar component of nucleic acid molecules of RNA is dextro, is, is, is right-handed. The, the, essentially, all the sugars in your body, certainly all the sugars and all the RNA molecules in your body are, are dextro. But in principle, one could build RNA the other way, levo, out of left-handed sugar. And since this is our own construction and not something out of biology, what if we just flip the whole thing in the mirror and build a Levo version? OK, now, of course, it was not a Levo postdoc that did this. It was Charlie Olay is actually biological. Uh, but he built the replica, and Dave Horning also worked on this, built the enzyme and its pieces entirely as the enantiomer in the mirror. And of course, it has to behave the same. Water itself is not chiral. So if the building blocks and the catalyst are built as a mirror reflection, they replicate the same way, but they replicate in the mirror. 
Now, we did this actually for a practical application having to do with using this replicator as a molecular diagnostic. Not the D, the biological version, that's a very fragile molecule, but the L will actually replicate in human serum. I know that sounds frightening, but it isn't. It's, it's, it's a useful thing for it to be able to replicate in human serum and measure things that are in human serum based on its replication rate. That's the actual reason we did this. But I, I talk about it today because it really drives home the point, this is an artificial synthetic system. This is not taken from biology. So it goes exponential. It has an exponential growth rate of 0.03 a minute, a doubling time of about 20 minutes. Recently, we put the pedal to the metal and really tried to improve the behavior of this molecule and develop what we call the super replicator. Here's the version I just showed you, and here's the new souped up version. This one has a doubling time of about five minutes. This is work of Michael Robertson just published earlier this year. So now it replicates very quickly, doubling time of five minutes. Nothing in biology can replicate uh, that fast. Um, and then we did a kind of show off experiment. It's a zigzag experiment, okay, and through serial transfer, we carry this thing through 100 logs. We call this the Google experiment. That's G-O-O-G-O-L, 10 to the 100th power. So we did 10 to the 100th power in overall amplification in 37.5 hours. All right? And we didn't do it. I mean, the molecules just did it. So that's kind of where that game is. But that's the end of, of this case study. And it's, it's cool. I mean, we think this thing's cool. We, we enjoy putting it through its paces and making it better. But there's some shortcomings here with regard to the mission statement that comes from, as I said, Francis Crick, Richard Dawkins, and of course, the Simons collaboration on the origins of life. Only a few of the nucleotides are subject to evolution. These are the genes, and these are the parts that are in play, but you need the rest of it for it to, to replicate. So not every letter in the molecule is subject to evolution. There's a genetics within this molecule that is subject to evolution. And the only way we get variation is through recombination, and there's only one place where that happens. So it's kind of a limited system. L and L drawing D. We think this is probably the best shot we've had in a while at, at really cracking through to more generalized RNA catalyzed replication. Uh, Jeff Rogers uh, built the, one of the enzymes I talked about. Uh, the self replicating enzyme came from former postdocs in the lab, which then went exponential and has been refined. And John Sapansky has done the, the very recent work on what we call the cross chiral, actually, Jack coined that phrase, uh, cross chiral polymerase. Uh, in the past, the work has been funded through NASA, NIH for the, the stuff I mentioned, the molecular diagnostics, NSF work I didn't talk about today, and of course, very grateful to the Simons Foundation for their support. I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks.